Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dorsey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today is Friday, June 23rd, and we will hear about the National Zoning Atlas. For content questions related to the presentation, just type them in that Q&A box. We'll get to those at the end uh, during our designated Q&A. I will ask that if your question is for a particular panelist, please write their name in the question. It just makes it a lot easier for me when I'm, when I'm going through everything. Uh, if you have any technical questions, please type those also in the Q&A box and I will do my best to answer those. Up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring APA chapters and divisions for 2023. Thanks to all those participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to members. Today, we're sponsored by the Northern New England chapter of APA. So thanks for joining us today. Next on your screen is a list of our upcoming sessions throughout the summer. We have one more to add in between the 14th and the 28th of July that will be coming down the pipeline shortly. To register for these and all of our upcoming webcasts, head over to ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. Today's session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits. To log your credits, head over to planning.org log into your My APA account, and from there you can search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our website. Again, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And if you're on social media, be sure to like us on Facebook, just search planning webcast and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important date or time changes when new sessions are available for you to register for and a reminder for our upcoming Friday session. Also, we record all of our sessions and we post them onto our YouTube channel. So head over to YouTube, type in Planning Webcast, and we'll pop up along with our well over 400 recordings available to you for free. So be sure to subscribe to our channel so you get notified when new recordings are available. Again, don't forget to log your CM credits if you need them and uh, type your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to those at the end during the designated Q&A. All right, so now we're actually gonna start real quick with a polling question. I'm gonna go ahead and launch that. So you should see a pop-up uh, to my panelists. You don't get to vote, I'm sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> so it's, uh, do you believe zoning should be state or locally mandated? So the topic of uh, preemption here. Give it another second. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end it. One more, there. And I'm going to share the results. Okay, so 63% say that zoning should be regulated locally, 26% uh, state, and 11%, I don't know. Okay. All right. I am going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to turn it over to Aline, who is going to kick things off, introduce herself, and uh, get started. And you're also on mute, so don't forget to unmute yourself. Sorry, it, everything switched around there. Thank you, Christine, so much uh, for having us. And um, I'm, I'm really glad to be talking to planners. I myself was a planner for New York City, Department of City Planning for over 10 years. And the last few years I was there, I did a lot of trainings for planners and it's um, something I really love to do. Um, I am the project coordinator for zoning for the National Zoning Atlas. And the National Zoning Atlas is hosted out of Cornell's Architecture, Art and Planning School. And uh, it's in their planning department's legal constructs lab. So we're deep in there 
and we're a small team, but we are quickly growing. Um, I have another, I have a partner, Scott, who handles the geospatial side of things. So if anyone has questions on mapping, I will try, but I might have to come back later <laughs> with some answers for any, any really tricky ones. Um, with that, um, I guess I will kick it off here. Um, the National Zoning Atlas is essentially a collaborative of people all over the country digitizing, demystifying, and democratizing US zoning codes. And I honestly, this is um, this is really appealing to me because in addition to being a planner, I'm also a librarian. I have an information and library science degree. And so part of my, uh, what compelled me to come and take this job was that this is really an opportunity to produce a very rich data resource that can help planners all over the country uh, do their jobs better. So that's a lot of why I'm here. And why do we need to do this? Um, so I'm not sure how, how many of you are aware, but we have over 30,000 jurisdictions in this country. And each one of them may or may not have zoning authority. And each one of them may or may not exercise that authority. So we think there may be around 30,000 zoning codes. Not sure, we're gonna find out. <laughs> um, and uh, some of them are, are online. You can find them online and you can look at the text and you can look at the maps. They might even have GIS out there. And some of them are in a desk drawer pinned to someone's wall, may not be very accessible and might be hidden away. Um, so we don't know what all of these codes say. They have never been compiled altogether. And many of you know that zoning is complicated. We essentially use a legal document and a map to describe a vision of a three-dimensional world that we wanna see. So by nature, zoning is just complicated. Um, and you can see here, a fun little older map of New York City zoning uh, that demonstrates, I think, some of that complexity. So if we're successful and we build out this atlas, we will have standardized measures that will allow us to compare jurisdictions to jurisdictions. We can do an apples to apples comparison of different zoning districts. We can then open up opportunities to research zoning code. Uh, I know one of my frustrations as a planner was, um, I was assigned to look into industrial mixed use with residential. And I was just doing like Google searches all over the place. It was like impossible to find good precedents for that sort of thing without already knowing where they were occurring. It was very frustrating. So hopefully this will open up academic research, but also allow planners to do research that can then strengthen their plans and regional plans that are going on all over the country. In turn, this should help inform legislators the decision makers who decide what sort of laws or you know local um, regulations we have regarding land use, it'll help advocates advocate better for the changes that are needed to produce those communities that we want to see, and allow developers to make smarter decisions. Um, and then ultimately, we want to democratize participation in land use decisions. So I'm, I'm guessing there's a lot of people out there who have have had to sit through <laughs> public hearings and not heard germane comments to the actual zoning regulations. And, um, and this will really help, I believe, help people, regular people show up to their planning board and be able to make cogent arguments and actually advocate for rational things to make their communities better. Um, one of my favorite experiences so far um, started in January was when a gentleman from Connecticut actually reached out and, um, told us thank you because he used the Connecticut Zoning Atlas to produce a map that he took to his local planning board and was able to convince them that they, they should implement an ADU regulation to allow ADUs in their community. And he was super thrilled that they ended up voting for it and he reached out and thanked us. And I'm like, that is what we wanna see happen. We wanna see people making um, good arguments to their own planning boards and making better decisions. Excuse me, I'm talking too fast. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, we have a methodology, it's a formal methodology. My supervisor, Sarah, who is the one who's, this is her brainchild. Um, she produced the first version of this uh, and we just released a second version, um, I think about a week ago. And it is a unique standardized methodology that all of the teams use to produce a data set and a map. And um, 
In addition to having the methodology, we also have a centralized database and data entry system that we launched this year to make it easier to do this. So this new methodology um, is generally the same, but it incorporates that new database and data entry system. And um, like I said, it's being implemented all across the country. Um, here's a little, um, a couple snippets from the interface itself. Um, it allows, uh, pr prior to this, we were doing this through spreadsheets. And this uh, is hopefully an easier, all of the analysts I've demoed this to and who've used it have said it's much easier than using a giant Excel spreadsheet. Um, uh, but it also allows you to do a lot of tracking. So you can see in the little map on the upper right, this is the New York State team's um, map. And you can see it tells them, it tells me how many, how many jurisdictions we're working on, how many we've published that are complete, um, and how many don't have their geospatial files uploaded that sort of thing. And we could pull all sorts of data, either zoning districts, jurisdictional data, um, all, all of that can be pulled out. We also use it to store all the documents. So we upload the zoning codes, the zoning maps and GIS files into the system. So it's all nicely stored and easy to search and find. Oh, it also allows for a review procedure. So um, planners uh, or analysts who are doing the work can finish uh, doing the review of a zoning district, submit it to their team leader who can then review it, either choose to, to mark it complete or send it back with comments for them to adjust or check some things. And each team has their own little space within the system so that they're not stepping on each other's toes or you know, data is not, not getting shared unnecessarily. The actual analysis is focused on the seven uses you see to the left. And all of these are, uh, you'll notice residential. Um, they, uh, in each one of those cate categories of uses, we have about a hundred data points that we collect on each one. So if it's, uh, um, so we have um, minimum lot sizes, maximum densities, parking requirements, how much lot coverage they can have, whether they have to be connected to water and sewer, all of that sort of thing around the lots. We also um, capture structural information, uh, front yards, rear yards, side yards, um, maximum number of units, unit minimum unit sizes, maximum heights and, and feet and stories, all of that sort of thing. We, we grab all of that data um, and we have it in our database. On the geospatial side, uh, they're doing similar work. They're gathering up the zoning map, then they look at GIS files, make sure they're in alignment. Sometimes they're not. Um, so they, they do clean them up and then implement, uh, add them to the system so that they can be visualized. And here you can see a sample of what uh, the final zoning atlas on the national level might look like. We're still working on it. Um, but this is kind of the sort of, uh, this is from Montana, which you'll hear about later. Um, but this is the sort of data um, that when it's combined, you have your your uh, um, zoning attributes, and then you'll have your shape files, and they'll produce a very nice little map that you can do some analysis on. Currently, we're working on figuring out all the different types of ways that you can filter and produce different sorts of analyses. In terms of our structure, we have, uh, in addition to providing the tool to do the, the, um, the actual data collection and the methodology, we also provide access to the National Research Collaborative. Um, so all of our state teams get to talk to each other, learn from each other, share resources and that sort of thing. Um, we also, we, can, we have regular meetings with them. We have office hours to, to support their teams, both for zoning and geospatial guidance. Uh, and then we also do some support in their launches and in their startup. So we help them connect to funders, put their teams together initially, and then when they're done with their state atlas, we help them launch it. We help them do publicity support and research, all of that sort of stuff. The state and regional teams, they do all the hard work. So they're collecting the codes, they're reading the codes, they're entering the data, they're collecting all these geospatial files. If they exist, if they don't, they're creating them from scratch. Um, there are some techniques we've been picking up and we try to, to also um, gather up data that we find at the national level to help the state teams with this. But sometimes it does come down to just, you have a paper map, you gotta just draw the GIS for. Um, they also do, um, you know, might do research reports and publicity. And a lot of them, and you'll hear about this, 
uh, work towards doing policy changes, um, both state and locally. The state team structure tends to vary. Um, there is one or many state leaders and they might have different roles. Usually uh, we'd like to see an institution that's involved that can handle grant funding and the administration of that sort of funding. There may also be someone who focuses on legal end of things, planning end of things, that sort of thing to help guide the team when the questions come up. Um, and then you have the two types of analyst teams and they do the work and then it all comes together in their state atlas, which then gets funneled up into the national one. Here is our very first completed atlas. This is Connecticut. Um, and you can see here that, you know, there's a lot of ways to filter it. And um, the real joy of this is that it produces very simple diagrams that allow you to understand the issues that are going on statewide. So here you can see that for Connecticut, 91% of the state allows single family housing as of right, but only 2% allows four or more units as of right. So this might directly explain the housing crisis that they're going through. We have teams all over the country. We have um, 20, uh, over 25, so over half of the country is covered at this point. And of those, we have um, Connecticut launched, New Hampshire launched, which you'll hear from too. Uh, Montana, did they did a partial, all the major cities in Montana. And Tennessee did a major jurisdiction uh, metro area and um, they're working towards filling out their whole state. In addition to wearing the hat of the project coordinator on the National Zoning Atlas side, I also have the joy of being the New York co-director um, as well as uh, newly, uh, we just got funding from NSF and HUD to do Wyoming and Nevada. So uh, I get to be a co-director on, on three state teams as well as, as helping the, the national, um, everyone else. We have a variety of funders and partners, and they are kind of all over the place. We have uh, educational institutions. We work a lot with students. We work with, um, uh, so a lot of students, like planning students, law students do a lot of the work. We have um, affordable housing groups. We have policy think tanks, uh, regional and state governments, federal government organizations, all are contributing to both funding and, and getting this work done. It's really been kind of an amazing thing to see so many different types of groups, professional organizations, obviously APA, and then um, I think we have some realtor organizations. So it's been a, a really nice broad range of people. I do want to point out, we also have um, people who are interested just in open data. So you'll see Code for America down there. Um, they're helping out Hawaii, and they have been extremely helpful in terms of helping us think through our public map and making it accessible and um, more user friendly. So they're bringing some user experience um, um, ideas to us so that we can make a better map for everyone. Uh, just a little bit on the New York Zoning Atlas. We are uh, we have over fifteen hundred jurisdictions. So this is this is not the the most dense state for jurisdictions, but it's it's up there. And um, we have a lot of partners. We are work. We have two regional teams. We have one in New York City that's being run by uh, the Fordham University Law School, and we have. Uh, RPA, our Regional Planning Association for the New York metro area, who is working with a couple of groups on Long, Long Island, as well as the City University of New York uh, to do NASA on Suffolk counties. And then we have Buffalo School of Law has done a lot of data research on the Erie area. We have another regional group that might be helping with Orleans and Monroe counties. We have a bunch of um, rogue planners in, in counties upstate as well. And um, Cornell is actually taking the lead on most of the um, rest of the state, which would be that kind of Ithaca region in the center there and that Westchester kind of lower downstate area north of New York City. We are currently searching for funders. Um, here's a little bit snippet of what you might get out of this. So here is Briarcliff Manor. Uh, this is a small jurisdiction north of New York City along the Hudson. Uh, just south of Ossining, uh, New York, which I think is famous for its prison, Sing Sing. 
Um, but uh, here you can see that of their 22 zoning districts, only five allow three or more units to be built without a public hearing. And none of those districts happen to be adjacent to uh, the Metro North Line, which long, runs along the river on the west side of um, this map. So a little disappointing there. And um, here we have Pelham Manor. This is a small village um, directly north of the Bronx. Uh, you could see the, the, the border line there in gray across the bottom or diagonally across here. I have my pointer, that's what it's for here. Um, and um, you can see that they only have one district that allows two or more. So just north of one of our more populated areas in the state, there's only one tiny area in this um, particular place that, that allows this. Um, with that, and I, I think I'm on time, um, I, if anyone is interested in helping out, wants to start a team, wants to join a team, wants to just see what we're doing, we are um, on social media. You can follow us and our website is zoningatlas.org. Feel free to reach out. We are always looking for volunteers uh, for, for help in state teams where we don't have coverage. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, um, wonderful, I think, and very hopeful um, experience for me. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ben and Max to talk a little bit about New Hampshire. Thanks so much, Aileen. I, I, I love your reference to uh, rogue planners and I'm, I'm just imagining what a rogue planner is and does. It sounds kind of like an oxymoron, but isn't. Um, my name is Ben Frost. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Legal Officer at New Hampshire Housing. We're our state's housing finance agency. Um, I've been a planner for, I was doing the math this morning, going on uh, 40 years. Um, and I've been working at the local, state, and regional levels, uh, starting in New York and then in Maine, and for the past uh, 30 years here in New Hampshire. I'm also an attorney practicing uh, mainly in municipal law, but really focusing on housing policy. Um, I've been doing that for the past uh, 25 years and here at New Hampshire Housing for now 17 years. Um, it has been my uh, delight uh, and pleasure and honor uh, to have been able to work on the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas uh, from, uh, from, from the get-go, really. Uh, and to do that work with my friend and colleague, uh, Max Latona, who will start our presentation and then we'll go back and forth through our slides. Max? Thank you, Ben. That's very kind and the pleasure has been mutual. Um, my name is Max Latona. I am not a planner by trade or um, a lawyer, but, uh, but rather a philosopher, as it turns out, an ethicist. Um, but uh, I run the Center for Ethics in Society uh, here at St. Anselm College in Manchester, New Hampshire. And uh, we were um, excited to do this project, this National Zoning Atlas, for reasons I'll explain in a moment, uh, with the partners uh, such as Ben. Um, and, uh, and I got to tell you that as I've come to meet more and more people in the planning community, I have to say I, I have a secret love for, for your work. So I'm a philosopher and I'd like to say a closet planner. Um, at any rate, um, I am going to, as Ben said, introduce you to the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas. And I, first thing I want to note is it's a partnership or a collaboration between the Center for Ethics and Society at St. Anselm College, uh, New Hampshire Housing, our, our State Financing Authority, Housing Finance Authority, and the State Office of Business and Economic Affairs. And I think that collaboration has been very fruitful, um, but we can talk about that later if you like. So um, let's see, let me move my slide forward. Okay, so maybe the first question I should answer is why has a Center for Ethics in Society um, been involved in producing a zoning atlas? And the simple answer to that is we were incredibly inspired by Sarah Bronin, the founder of the National Zoning Atlas. Uh, she came to speak um, at our state uh, forum, our state um, affordable housing stakeholder forum in December of 2021. And we were all so inspired. We said, why don't we do what she's done in Connecticut uh, here in New Hampshire? But more deeply, I guess I would say that our center is committed to helping uh, communities in New Hampshire address the ethical issues that they're facing. And we identified early on some years ago the affordable housing crisis as uh, perhaps the most important ethical issue that our communities in New Hampshire are facing. Um, and you know, just quickly, why, why do we think that? Um, because we think the crisis and the suffering that it's causing is not something outside our control. It's within our control. 
And, um, and it's largely a problem of supply. And the problem of supply is largely a problem of the, what we can call exclusionary zoning that's happening in towns and communities across uh, our state. So as I say here, quite simply, we, our position is that not all zoning, but exclusionary zoning is unjust. And while it may protect some good things for ourselves, and I emphasis on may there, um, in doing so, it wrongfully deprives others of things that are even more basic and important, including access to a safe and affordable home. And uh, we could talk again more about that position and maybe some questions you might have about it at length, but, um, but that's, that's our fundamental position and why we are motivated to, um, to, to produce this atlas, to help our state reflect on the zoning that we have um, community by community and how it's impacting housing supply and affordability. So with that, um, I'll just look, uh, glance at some of the other members of our team, very valuable members. So in addition to Ben and I, there's Noah Hodgetts, the principal uh, planner at the New Hampshire Office of Planning and Development. And he just won uh, the Planner of the Year Award from the New Hampshire Planners Association. Uh, uh, Rick Leader at Barnes, um, an exceptional GIS specialist who helped us with all the GIS um, materials. Uh, Sarah Marchant, Chief of Staff, Vice President of Rock NH, the Community Loan Fund and Jason Sorens, a senior research faculty at the American Institute for Economic Research. And he oversaw much of the student uh, intern work that collected the data. So I think I'm gonna turn this now over to Ben, uh, to talk a little bit about the unique context in New Hampshire. Thanks, Max. And, and Max, you say it's unique, um, but I'm, I'm sure as folks take a look at the concepts, if not the numbers on the slide, uh, the concepts will be very familiar. Uh, so New Hampshire Housing uh, recently published a statewide housing needs assessment in which we determined uh, that we have a current need uh, for 23,500 units. That is, that's short of supply. Uh, the, the, the supply is short of, of meeting the demand that is extant today. Uh, forget about future growth. We need uh, almost 24,000 units of housing produced today to meet current demand. Now, that might not seem like a lot if you're from California or New York or Florida or Texas or any of the larger states that have a big population. But for a state with a population of 1.3 million, uh, 23,000 units is a lot. We've also determined that to meet expected future population growth and household growth, uh, we'll need 60,000 units by 2030 and a total of about 90,000 units produced by 2040. Uh, that is to account for the current shortage of supply and future growth. Uh, and we are simply not producing housing uh, at, at a rate that would meet that uh, identified need. We have a total of 269 jurisdictions with zoning authority. And I, I smiled when I was listening to Aline talk about New York. I, I was 10 times the number of jurisdictions, but we're a small state um, and that's the way it is. We're a small state that has a very uh, vibrant tradition of local control, even though New Hampshire is not a home rule state. We're a Dillon's rule state. So all power that municipalities have to do zoning is a grant of authority from the state legislature. And yet uh, most municipalities uh, think that they are the kings of their own kingdoms. Um, also, we're a pretty rural state. Uh, you know, Manchester is our largest city with a population of about 115,000. Uh, the median size of communities in New Hampshire is about 28, 2900. Um, I myself live in a town of 2900 people. And, you know, it, it's, there's a, a hyper focus on this preservation of rural character. And that has manifested itself uh, over the years in large lot single family zoning. Um, the Atlas, uh, the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas was launched in early of May 2023, uh, uh, just uh, a little over a month ago. And show the, the, the zoning atlas shows, and we'll we'll talk about the findings, some of our preliminary findings, how difficult it is to build here anything other than a large lot single family home. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ben. So um, now we can talk just a little bit about some of the data and methodology that went into the New Hampshire Atlas. Um, much of this, I think, is just reinforcing some of the uh, things that Eileen already described. Um, but uh, our, our, the scope of our atlas um, 
includes over 23,000 pages of zoning, subdivision, and site plan review ordinances and zoning maps. Uh, the data was frozen as of June 1st, 2022. I will say that our interns are busy right now uh, creating um, a new uh, data set uh, that includes all of the 2023 uh, changes that happened in March, March town meetings and, 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 and elsewhere. So um, we should have a new uh, data set in 2023 soon that can be used to compare to uh, 2022. Um, in terms of um, districts and jurisdictions, there are 269 jurisdictions, uh, uh, as I think Ben may have mentioned, and uh, that includes 2,139 districts. For each uh, district, we categorized it as residential, mixed with residential or non-residential, the latter including uh, primary and primarily industrial, primarily commercial or primarily uh, conservation. Um, and then for each district, we, um, we um, categorized uh, regulations uh, for one, two, three, four, and five family. Um, I will note that five family is a special category for New Hampshire because we have a workforce housing statute that defined um, uh, workforce housing uh, as including five plus multifamily units. Um, so also affordable housing, uh, accessory dwelling units, and, and manufactured housing. Uh, and then for each one of those treatments, um, we have all those dimensional regulations that Aline mentioned, including minimum lot size, setback requirements, lot coverage, height restrictions, um, floor to area ratio, uh, and more, and, and also parking requirements. So um, our, our uh, data set includes over 400,000 uh, individual uh, data points, uh, which was a lot of work for our student interns. And, and Ben and I both agree on uh, giving most of the credit for this entire project to those hardworking uh, interns. So. Um, yeah, just a few other things about methodology. Um, as far as the uh, the atlas, the interactive atlas itself, um, as you know here in the audience, since regulations governing housing uh, production vary depending on uh, soil condition and the presence of water and sewer, we had to average um, those very those values. So ideal and worst conditions to produce a single numerical value for the purpose of uh, of producing the graphic atlas. That said, however, we do have a complete data set that includes um, the, the, the um, sub, uh, sub ideal conditions, the ideal conditions and average conditions uh, for researchers who, who would like to look at that. Um, and all of that can be found by the way at nhzoningatlas.org, um, that entire um, set of resources data sets. Um, yeah, and again, we don't um, include parcel level data in our, um, in our atlas. Uh, and, but we do provide links to all of the different codes and ordinances. Uh, so uh, researchers or builders or anybody interested in, in looking at the codes themselves can easily access them from the Atlas. And at the end, again, I uh, just wanna say before we look at our statewide findings, um, what we hope to do with this is to generate a statewide discourse about the ways that zoning in our communities, both individually, but also in the aggregate, affect housing supply and affordability. So with that said, um, I'll start with some of the select findings and then turn it over to Ben. So having done all this work on the Atlas and collecting the data, we discovered um, a number of, 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 of sort of striking things. Um, the first is, and perhaps unsurprisingly, in New Hampshire, it's hard to find land to build small homes or what we call starter homes in an economically viable way. The reason is that most communities have prohibited single family homes on small lots over most or all of their territory. And so if you look at the graphic here, you'll see that we defined a small lot as less than an acre and less than 200 feet of frontage. And we could of course debate why we did that, but we did find that the 40,000 uh, square foot lot was a typical tipping point in many of the codes. Uh, so this is what we chose as a definition of a small lot. Um, and then looking at the, at the um, image of the state, you'll see that there's a lot of gray. That's the non-buildable area. Those, that's um, uh, permanent conservation areas, those are um, uh, wetlands and large water bodies. Uh, and then of the remaining area, you'll see the orange, which is where uh, single uh, families are allowed on small lots. Turns out that's just 16% of the buildable area of the state, a really small percentage. And as you can see, some of those areas are in the northern part of the state, which is um, really not very heavily populated, not close to job centers. Um, so uh, you'll see the, the orange then is, is where it's single family uh, are allowed on small lots. Um, the purple is where small lot single families are prohibited. And, and we know from our Atlas that many communities have, as perhaps in other parts of the country, 
a five or six or even a 10 acre minimum lot size uh, for, for single family homes. So um, that's our first finding. The second finding um, and uh, connected with this, I suppose, is that in New Hampshire, there is less area zone for small lot two family homes than there is for any other type of housing. Um, and and, and to, to really reinforce that, there are actually 70 jurisdictions in the state that don't allow two family by right anywhere. So looking at the, um, the graphic again, uh, uh, you'll see that duplexes are allowed again in the orange. That turns out to be uh, only 11% of the buildable area of the state. Um, and uh, the yellow, um, there are some uh, income uh, restricted um, uh, areas. And then uh, the purple is prohibited. And again, the gray is non-developable. So uh, the density metric here is, is greater than two units per acre, by, by the way. So uh, finding number three, uh, many of New Hampshire's communities, including those close to job markets, require larger lots for multifamily housing, thereby driving up the cost of these homes and making them unaffordable to residents. Um, so again, small lot five families defined as less than 2.5 uh, units per acre, uh, I'm sorry, less than 2.5 uh, uh, acres, um, less than 300 feet of frontage and a density of greater than two units per acre. And you'll see in the orange that that's actually um, more than um, duplexes and even single families, as we mentioned, it's 22% of the buildable area of the state. And we think that the reason that multifamily housing is easier to build in the state than duplexes is because of that workforce housing legislation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, that legislation requires that communities provide uh, reasonable and realistic opportunities for workforce housing, which includes um, five plus family, multifamily housing. So um, that kind of indicates too that communities tend to do in New Hampshire the bare minimum that they need to do in order to meet um, the requirements. So um, I'm sure you might have some questions about some of those three initial three findings, but um, feel free to offer those toward the end. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ben now for finding number four. Finding number four. You know, one of the, the benefits of this zoning atlas approach is that you can take the existing atlas and its uh, layers of data and uh, add to it. So you can take the database and, and do your own analysis uh, and, and experiment with it. We did this with uh, the Manchester area. So Manchester, as I said earlier, is our largest community. And we looked at the city of Manchester and the surrounding seven communities and did a more detailed analysis looking at not only uh, the uh, the area that we consider to be non-developable because it's in conservation or something like that. But we also uh, looked at the Microsoft building footprint data layer and used that to indicate, well, okay, looking at the individual parcels, where are the buildings, uh, where do buildings exist? And what are the parcels that have existing or uh, a potential for further development? And what we found was that uh, before doing that analysis, the, the area uh, that is uh, by right buildable for small lots in this eight community region is 21%. Now, recognize that it's zoned for single family development over 89% of the area, but for small lots, it's only 21%. But if you take those lots that have already been developed, what's available for, for building potential for a small lot single family home shrinks to 7.8%. And this is in one of the most densely populated areas of our state. Next slide. We extend this analysis also to look at the potential for uh, two, you know, small lot two family potential duplexes and also for uh, small lot five family potential. Recognize these are uh, slightly different characteristics and the even for, um, and, and you see that you know, the area that's available for five lot is pretty restricted in the, the town in the lower uh, right-hand quadrant, uh, the southeast corner, London Dairy, uh, allows a lot of uh, five uh, five plus unit uh, construction, but it's age restricted, which is not really what we need here in New Hampshire with uh, a population that we're hoping to grow as our economy grows. Next slide. Uh, New Hampshire also uh, has a law that requires municipalities uh, to allow a, an attached accessory dwelling unit wherever single family homes are allowed. This was a, a law that was adopted by our legislature in 2016. It has a lot of flexibility though. And uh, many communities use that inherent 
statutory flexibility to impose barriers uh, to the development of ADUs, including, as you see, those communities that are shown here in the, the bright pink shade, those communities that require three or four parking spaces for an accessory dwelling unit, which is really shocking if you think about it. I mean, irrespective of the size of the ADU or the number of bedrooms, let's say uh, there's one town in the, the very bottom of the, the map there, that's the town of Hudson. Uh, it requires four parking spaces for an accessory dwelling unit. And there's no way that you're gonna need that. Next slide, please. Also uh, in New Hampshire, uh, manufactured housing we regard as a really important means of uh, having people uh, develop what we would call naturally occurring affordable housing. That is without public subsidy. Uh, it's just inherently more affordable than other types of single family homes. And unique, well, not uniquely, but unusual under New Hampshire law, uh, manufactured housing is considered to be real property, which means you can get a conventional single family mortgage for a manufactured housing. Uh, the purchasers don't have to resort to commercial mortgages with exorbitant interest rates. Um, and yet, uh, you look at the resistance that so many municipalities have to manufactured housing, no matter what the quality is of the housing. Uh, what is allowed in New Hampshire on either a small lot or in parks, most of which are already built out, uh, is limited to 9.9% of the developable area statewide. I'll turn it back to Max to talk about the rollout plan. Okay, yes, briefly. So um, our, our rollout plan, Plan began um, early this, this year in, in March uh, with pre-briefings with stakeholders. We felt very strongly that, um, that there needed to be a number of communities or constituencies in the state that needed to be um, alerted or become aware of this atlas uh, before it became public and to give them an opportunity to provide feedback and also to become stakeholders and, and feel a part, of the, a part of the effort. So those include uh, the planning community, regional planning commissions, uh, the state municipal association, workforce housing coalitions, affordable housing uh, uh, groups, um, builders and developers, and others. Um, so um, after we have done that, we also reached out to the state legislature and and had um, uh, sessions with the um, some committees with the state legislature to to educate them about our effort. Uh, and then I think one of the most important things we did was a media pre-briefing prior to the public launch of the atlas inviting reporters from um, media outlets from across the state and region, particularly those reporters interested in housing uh, stories, uh, to attend this sort of pre-briefing, um, learn about the Atlas, and then we asked them to embargo uh, the, the story until the next day. Um, some of them didn't actually honor that. But, uh, and then uh, we had our public launch event on May 9th. Um, we had representatives from across the state and different communities attend a public uh, event where we released the Atlas, showed people uh, how to use it and, and our statewide findings. Um, and then uh, since then, we've been very busy across the state uh, and region presenting the Atlas to different groups and constituencies and, and really trying to stimulate conversation about um, not only um, uh, our zoning, but in, in each community, but again, some of those statewide findings that are um, limiting uh, some of our housing production. Um, so we, what we hope to do um, in the remainder of this year and, and in future years is to work with communities, individual communities, to provide our atlas and our data and our researchers as a tool uh, to support the kind of conversations they need to have in their communities about zoning. Um, and, and, and again, hopefully to, uh, to make an impact on some of the uh, restrictions. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Ben to wrap up. So these conversations that Max talks about is really uh, the most important thing. Uh, while you know we see the the zoning atlas as a a I say a data based driver of policy, and that's really uh, what we we hope to get out of this. It's all going to be because people are talking about it, and what we're seeing statewide is this uh, really robust conversation that people are having about the nature of zoning in their individual communities. Uh, and the legislature also is taking note of what's going on here. Um, it's important to note, too, that uh, these data are all available. So those 400,000 points of data that Max mentioned can be downloaded by anyone and used for research and analysis, comparing one community to another, 
uh, comparing groups of communities, looking at uh, zoning statewide. Uh, this is available for anyone to work with. And ultimately, coming full circle back to Max's first point about the ethics of this all, um, we want to acknowledge and address the inequities in patterns of development that have been the result of exclusionary zoning. And with our last slide, there's uh, where you can find the New Hampshire Zoning Atlas and send us uh, your requests. If you find an error, please let us know using that address. And here we'll we'll stop sharing our screen and turn it over to Kendall to talk about Montana. All right, I'll get my slides up here. Um, well, hello, everybody. My name is Kendall Cotton. I'm the president and CEO of the Frontier Institutes here in Montana. Uh, we are a, a free market, independent think tank. Uh, our mantra is that we believe in solving problems with uh, more freedom rather than more government. So uh, we're very interested in areas where uh, government gets in the way of people building homes, uh, getting jobs, starting businesses. And our mission is to uh, bring in experts, uh, provide research, and build coalitions to hopefully break down those government barriers. And uh, our goal is that, you know, so all Montanans can thrive. Um, so about, you know, just over two years ago, uh, you know, Montana was dealing with really a robust housing crisis. Uh, we we uh, have kind of been discovered as a state uh, during the pandemic uh, with the advent of, you know, really remote work for a lot of industry sectors. A lot of folks on the coasts are saying, why am I living here and not in Montana? So uh, we had a massive population influx uh, over the last couple of years. And that uh, really led to uh, immense pressure on the housing market. In fact, I think for a, a while there, uh, and just until recently, Bozeman, Montana was seeing a median uh, home sale price of like eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So um, that was a that's the town I went to college in, and uh, that was a good example of just how bad things have gotten here in Montana. Um, and, you know, really the concern went beyond affordability for a lot of Montanans. Uh, the concern was, you know, if our state's going to grow like this, um, everybody was worried that we're going to turn into states uh, like um, Colorado or like California. Um, and we would kind of lose the specialness of what makes Montana a great place to live, where we have these tight knit communities and this great access to the outdoors. We're one of the few places left in the world where you can be, you know, working at your office job in Missoula, Montana, and then, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, be on the mountain bike path or, or be uh, fishing the, uh, a blue ribbon trout stream. So um, that was something that uh, was top of mind for Montanans. If you walk down the sidewalk in Bozeman or Missoula, um, housing affordability was the top concern. Um, but when we started looking around uh, for solutions, we, we noticed that there was a strong skepticism from uh, local leaders in a lot of these communities, um, even running against the advice of their city staff and the, pl the, the city planners um, against this idea of zoning reform. And there was a skepticism that zoning reform was even a viable strategy uh, to, a to address our housing crisis. So uh, we were looking at what uh, Sarah and her team did in Connecticut with the Connecticut Zoning Atlas. And uh, we decided that uh, that would be a great model for us to uh, really visualize the extent of zoning in Montana and how zoning plays a role in our housing market, in our, in our housing supply, and uh, by consequence, affordability uh, in Montana. So we set out to create the, the Montana Zoning Atlas project. And um, we, you know, Montana is a, a vast state. We have a lot of empty areas that don't even necessarily have zoning. Um, so we, we chose to evaluate uh, and focus on the growing areas. So we, we focused on 13, you know, fast growing Montana counties, the places where that we're seeing, you know, probably the most population pressure over the last couple of years. And, you know, our goal was just to clearly demonstrate how zoning plays a role in, um, you know, preventing uh, people from being able to build these af most affordable types of starter homes like duplexes and uh, accessory dwelling units. Um, and hopefully give that information um, as a resource to lawmakers to hopefully spur reform. 
Um, we zeroed in on, uh, so we zeroed in on exclusionary zoning, just like New Hampshire, and uh, we kind of termed it differently in Montana. We, we, we termed it California style zoning rather than exclusionary zoning. Um, and it's true, you know, exclusionary zoning um, uh, tactics were, for the most part, pioneered by California cities at the turn of the, cent of the 20th century. Uh, cities like Los Angeles were some of the first cities to implement, you know, this, this uh, zoning regime that excludes multifamily, uh, smaller units, um, and smaller lots from the majority of their city centers. Um, and that's a that's a big problem and um, something that we communicated to to local leaders and state leaders was that, um, you know, these types of homes, these uh, kind of missing middle style developments, the duplexes and the triplexes and the, the ADUs, um, those are typically the most affordable types of homes to build. They're more affordable by design compared to single family homes on large lots. And so by excluding those homes from vast portions of our communities, we're really um, doing a disservice to the affordability and, uh, and, and taking the rungs out the ladder for young families, renters and workers who are trying to move into our cities or start their lives there. So when we broke down the data using the National Zoning Atlas methodology, uh, we ended up finding that, yes, indeed, um, you know, zoning <laughs> was a big factor in uh, Montana cities. 50% of zone land in uh, the counties that we uh, analyzed either outright prohibit this uh, missing middle style development or uh, penalize it with uh, regulatory hoops and conditions and things like that. Um, among the major cities, two-family housing was on average welcomed by right on just 41% of zone land. Uh, Three-plus-family three family housing was uh, uh, welcomed on average on only just 29%. Um, and I'll show you in the next slides how we demonstrated to lawmakers and kind of visualized how it's not just about the classic, you know, kind of straight-up prohibitions on uh, certain types of homes in certain zones, it uh, matters as you add types of zoning regulations on top of each other. So for our first iteration of our zoning atlas, oops, there we go. So for the first iteration of our zoning atlas, one of the things we did is we just looked at two types of common zoning regulations. We looked at just straight up whether you allow things like duplexes or you don't. And then we also looked at minimum lot sizes. And we did a parcel level analysis based on the data we collected to determine where you can build duplexes, uh, where you're allowed to build duplexes or, or other types of homes, and where you can't. And uh, we were able to kind of create a profile for each major city in Montana that was dealing with you know, the brunt of this housing crisis. Um, this is uh, the zoning map of Missoula, Montana. That was one of the fastest growing areas of the state. It was also one, uh, one of the most expensive areas to buy a home in uh, dur during these last few years and still is. It's one of the most in-demand cities. Uh, and it's also a prime example of how this California style zoning has kind of infiltrated cities like Missoula and is uh, adding to the housing crisis. So uh, you'll see here the, the blue areas show where you can build uh, duplexes or greater. So, so uh, two plus multifamily homes. And the pink areas indicate where you can't. Uh, when, it, when you add it up in total, it's, it's nearly uh, three quarters of the city. It's over three quarters of the city. Um, and that is concerning from an affordability standpoint. If uh, the, the vast majority of the city, you can only build uh, in, in these primary residential areas, expensive single family homes uh, and not the affordable starter homes, we're doing a disservice to our low and middle income residents. Um, in the next slides, I'm going to show you how we visualized how zoning, uh, different aspects of zoning like minimum lot sizes and single family zoning work in tandem to exclude um, these sorts of homes that we're talking about. So first we'll look at where... Um, uh, duplexes and townhomes are uh, welcomed by right in Missoula. Um, that's the blue areas they see in the map here. Uh, only 23% of the of the residential zones in Missoula welcome these, you know, affor affordable starter home types uh, by an explicit by right designation. Even less welcome, you know, three plus units. 
Now here's where it gets interesting. You'll see here on the map, the uh, light pink areas are where theoretically, based on the zoning designation, you're supposed to be able to build something like a duplex, but because of the minimum lot size required to build the duplex, um, it actually exceeds the dimensions of the existing lot and it creates what we call a de facto single family zone. Um, so even though you know on paper, it says you can build duplexes in these, in these areas, uh, when you actually look at the lots and the build of, uh, and what you're able to build based on the regulations, um, the duplexes are zoned out in these areas. So that constrains even further the areas that welcome this uh, affordable multifamily development in Missoula. So the, one of the, th the impactful things that we were able to do for folks in Montana and you know city leaders as well who were concerned about Montana turning into California is go in and show them what California cities look like with their zoning maps. So we we set we compared the map of the zoning map of Los Angeles and uh it's eerily similar to what we just saw with Missoula's zoning map. Um nearly identical in terms of uh the amount of of primary residential areas that exclude uh this missing middle development. And so one of the things we said was, you know, if Missoula is zoned like LA, it's going to grow like LA. And so what that means is that in 25 years, we're going to be pushing development out in sprawl. It's going to take over all of the rural areas that we all love about Montana. Um, it's going to take over open land and, and this, uh, the wild places that we all love. And, uh, you know, that was a really powerful um, illustration for a lot of our state and local leaders to hopefully get on board with zoning reform and to start to turn things around. Um, we're going to go through a, just a quick comparison of some of the other cities that we looked at in our first iteration of the Zoning Atlas. Um, here's the city of Whitefish. It's uh, right near Glacier National Park, so it's one of the most in-demand areas, um, and it, it prohibits uh, two-plus family homes in over 63% of the, of the city due to single-family zoning and minimum lot sizes combined. Bozeman, Montana, that's that's probably the most in-demand city in Montana. And again, you know, over half the city excludes this mo the most affordable types of starter homes. Kalispell is about the same way, over half. Billings, Montana. Billings is our largest city in Montana, one of the fastest growing areas as well. And uh, Billings uh, outright prohibits uh, two plus family homes in over 57% of the primary residential areas. An interesting note about Billings is that they had recent reforms that um, did away with classic minimum lot sizes, and they only impose minimum lot widths on lots. And so you can see on the map here with our parcel level analysis, we didn't find any what we called the de facto single family zones. Um, we only see basically just outright whether you allow something or not. Uh, an interesting thing that we found was that Helena, Montana, that's our state's capital city, um, actually permitted um, two plus family homes by right in 100% of the primary residential zones in the city. And additionally, they outright abolished minimum lot sizes in 2019 in, in response to this building affordability crisis. Um, so you could see here, you know, if you're a builder coming into Helena, it, 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 you have a lot more space in the city and a lot more percentage of the city where you could build multifamily developments. Um, and so that was something that we were able to use, uh, in our, in our advocacy to say, you know, look, uh, leaders, if you're skeptical about, about zoning reform, it can be done. Um, look at Helena, they're doing it. And it seems to be working. One of the interesting notes that we made was that if you look at some of the cities that have looser regulations, like Billings and like Helena, the price home prices are fairly uh, a, a little more reasonable compared to places like Bozeman and Helena and Kalispell and Whitefish that are seeing just incredibly high prices. Um, with our uh, expanded Zoning Atlas 2.0 that encompassed the full National Zoning Atlas methodology, uh, we were able to, to, again, provide a comparison for the major you know, cities in, uh, in Montana and additionally uh, look at you know, where they allow things like ADUs and where they allow um, you know, duplexes and beyond. 
Uh, one of the interesting things we we saw was that you know a, a city like Great Falls, which isn't seeing the extent of population uh, demand uh, uh, influx that other cities are seeing, um, has essentially a ticking time bomb. If they end up being a place that's discovered, uh, they only allow duplexes in eight percent of the city. And um, we've seen in news reports that that is causing problems with uh, development already. Um, and of course, you all know that it's not just about uh, how much you allow uh, for things like duplexes. It also matters how uh, complex your zoning codes are. And so we were able to compare you know, what types of zoning regulations these cities impose. And you can see there's pretty wide variability across cities. And what, what's interesting is that, you know, when you talk to some local leaders, they're very just tied to what their existing zoning code says. And they say that, oh, well, we can't get rid of that regulation. Everything would be chaos. And we say, we say well, look to your peers. The, these cities are um, working just fine without minimum lot sizes or maximum density restrictions or whatever. So when we published our zoning atlas in uh, in the spring of 2022, our, that was our first iteration, we really kind of sparked a statewide conversation. We had newspaper editorial boards responding to our atlas, uh, calling on their leaders to, to do something about this problem that we were able to crystallize in a visual format. Um, we also had local leaders reaching out to us, uh, local um, advocacy groups reaching out to us saying, uh, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I've been looking for data like this to be able to show my local city councilors why zoning reform is needed. So um, that was really great to see. It provoked a tremendous response. And uh, ultimately, it, 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 it uh, culminated with Governor Gianforte in Montana calling together a, a task force uh, of, of diverse leaders to uh, put together some solutions to address this, this crisis. Um, I was honored to be included on that task force, and um, the, the the goal of the task force was to, to develop uh, solutions that the legislature could then implement at the state level. Um, the task force was able to use the Montana Zoning Atlas as essentially justification for many of the recommendations that were made focused on uh, reducing regulations, streamlining permitting, and reforming this strict California-style zoning that we see in, in Montana cities and that our zoning atlas was able to visualize. From there, uh, the task force really kickstarted uh, wh what has been an amazing bipartisan coalition around zoning reform in Montana. Uh, we were able to partner with folks on the left and the right, really from all walks of life and from all different perspectives um, to come together and support zoning reforms, um, both at the local level and at the state level. Um, the governor has also been a leader in this space. Um, and, you know, he's been one of the few governors in the country who's really kind of, um, you know, stuck his neck out there and said, look, this is something that needs to happen. One of my favorite stories is I was at a, uh, a, a, a reception at the governor's um, house uh, earlier this spring, while, as the legislation was kind of winding through Montana's uh, legislature. And uh, when I pulled up, I noticed that literally across the street was a, a triplex. And I brought that up to Governor Gianforte, and he said, oh, oh, yeah, well, that's no big deal. <laughs> so our governor is, is uh, I think, uh, maybe a yimby in some sense. Um, we, we also were able to leverage the data that we had developed through the Montana Zoning Atlas through our coalition into really salient messages that were able to reach uh, folks wherever they were at on the political spectrum. If somebody cared about you know, the, the, the climate impacts of sprawl, of the climate impacts of zoning that prevents cities from becoming denser and more walkable, we were able to speak to that. We we're also able to speak to folks, you know, more so on the right, who were worried about uh, property rights and who cared about you know, preserving kind of the, the character of, of rural Montana. Um, so we were able to have a message that that uh, was tailored to wherever you were at, and that led to us being uh, very successful this legislative session in this spring. So I'll just quickly walk through the the uh, major bills that were part of the slate of zoning reforms that were passed in Montana earlier this year at the state level. Um, 
Senate Bill 323 from Senator Jeremy Trebus. Uh, this essentially abolishes single family zoning in cities that are greater than 5,000 uh, population statewide. And it restores the rights of landowners to build um, two unit housing. The way we defined it in the bill was not just duplexes, two units on a lot is allowed. Additionally, uh, the zoning, the SB 323 says that the zoning regulations imposed on landowners uh, building these two unit developments can't be more restrictive than what's required for a single family zoning lot. We're already seeing the impact of this. Uh, Whitefish uh, had proposed a pretty onerous landscaping, new landscaping ordinance just a month ago. And um, what they what they realized is that it wasn't in compliance with this new law that was passed because they required all this landscaping work for uh, all types of development except for single family homes. And so when they realized that that violates Senate Bill 323, they had to walk that back. And now they're excluding duplexes from those onerous requirements as well. Senate Bill 382 from Senator Forrest Mandeville, uh, that was referred to as the big bill. And it was a big bill. There was a lot, of, a lot of pages. It was a complete overhaul of our land use planning statutes. Um, and essentially, you know, at the end of the day, what this bill did is, is after uh, cities go through this new comprehensive planning process, it essentially eliminates the need for discretionary uh, permit approvals that are contingent on these contentious public hearings where you have the neighbors coming out saying, not in my backyard. Um, so essentially, uh, during the, the, the comprehensive planning phase, when there's determining the, the growth policy of the, of the city, um, they'll invite input, invite the public's input. And then once everybody agrees on the rules of the game and agrees on the zoning map, then we don't need any more public hearings because we've already gotten public input. Um, and that's gonna streamline development uh, tremendously in Montana. Um, additionally, it, it requires local governments to actually plan for the future and to determine how many houses do they think they'll need in you know, 10, 15 years, and how do we need to address our zoning map to accommodate that, uh, that housing need? Right now, there's no such requirement. Um, and then lastly, we also worked with um, Senator Mandeville to develop a, a menu of specific pro-housing reforms that local governments have to select from to encourage housing development. Things like eliminating minimum lot sizes, eliminating some of these owners' parking mandates, um, allowing for mixed-use development, et cetera. Um, this bill also requires that manufactured housing be treated equally to, to uh, single family housing and traditional housing. Um, and that's a, a, a big uh, a big deal, in my opinion. Senate Bill 528 from Senator Greg Hertz is our ADU bill that passed this year. Uh, it requires all municipalities to allow uh, at least one attached uh, uh, detached or internal accessory dwelling unit. Um, and the great thing about this bill is that it also tries to address some of the kind of poison pills that uh, local governments um, in other states that have implemented ADU laws at the state level have used to kind of circumvent those laws and continue to prevent ADUs from being developed. Um, so cities can't require that the ADUs be owner occupied uh, or mandate additional parking for accessory dwelling units or assess impact fees on those small developments. Uh, lastly, Senate Bill 245 from uh, Senator Zolnikov uh, broadly restores the rights of landowners in cities 7,000 uh, population and up to build uh, that multifamily and mixed use development in commercial zones. Um, it also focuses on um, the parking requirements for those sorts of developments, prohibiting local governments from mandating more than one off street parking spot per unit. Um, so that was a pretty tremendous slate of legislation, and uh, our bipartisan coalition was just absolutely thrilled. The governor championed these, these uh, laws when they were passed, and um, we've gotten just a tremendous amount of national attention for uh, these reforms. Oops. So um, I uh, welcome any questions, and uh, I would be happy to um, dive into further the Montana Zoning Atlas uh, interactive map that we've developed. So I'll uh, I'll go ahead and pull that up, and I guess we can start the Q and A. All right, great. Um, so if my fellow panelists will go ahead and 
turn your cameras back on. Um, and we're just, we're going to start very broadly uh, talking about the zoning atlas. And the first question is, and I'll tell you when I first heard about the zoning atlas, this was sort of my first question too, is um, we spend a lot of time gathering up all this information and putting it into the system um, to have available for, for everyone. But for example, I know here in Ohio, when the group that, that started the project was entering it in, I know of several cities already now that have completely just eliminated single family housing, you know, in their zoning code. And, and there's a lot of zoning reform going on across the country, which is great, but there's going to be a lot of changes. So this seems to be a very static piece. How are we making it not static? So that it's capturing all the things that are happening and the updates that are taking place in all of these different states. I, I can speak generally and I'll let the, the state teams if, if they want to, to speak on how they're handling it. Um, but in general, the, the new system that we have allows us to flag um, jurisdictions that do need to be updated once those, once those happen. Part of our methodology also involves reaching out to local planning um, uh, planners in, in jurisdictions and, and ensuring that they you know, review this stuff and then send it back. We don't get 100% on that, but um, if any of you do get one of those emails, I encourage you to um, actually respond and, and provide feedback. Um, but the hope is, is that by starting these relationships with the local planners and making these, this data set more broadly open, that one, we have the general public looking at it and saying, hey, we need this updated. That's the beauty of open data, right? We have the public out there saying this needs updated so we know to fix it. Um, and then we also have um, invested people, the state teams and these, and these planners in the jurisdictions who want to keep their data updated because it's useful to do these comparisons. The other thing that's nice about the new tool is that we keep all of the, the historical data. So when a jurisdiction revises its zoning, we keep the original zoning and we have a new set. And that allows us to actually do historical comparisons, which is going to be a really great research tool uh, for academics and other people who want to understand the changes of zoning over time. But I'll let anyone fill in the gaps that I may have missed. Well. I could speak um, to New Hampshire a little bit. I think I referenced it earlier. Um, so we're currently uh, working on updates uh, for 2023. Uh, so we have a team of interns who um, are going through the folder provided by the State Office of Planning and Development. Uh, the State Office collects uh, zoning changes that have been made by communities, but they don't have all the communities. They have, they're missing quite a few. So in those cases, the students are going directly to the town and the municipality uh, website to see if they can find the ordinance changes on the website or in the code. And then failing all that, they look at the meeting, the minutes from the town meetings in March, which is how zoning happens in our in most towns in New Hampshire to see if there were any uh, zoning changes uh, in, in the course of those meetings. But we did find out along the way that there were some 2022 um, updates that had not been publicized uh, last year when we were collecting all this data that were publicized later. So we're making corrections to the 2022 data set along the way. So, so that's our, um, our, our hope to get those changes made in the next 60 days or so, and then have, as Aileen mentioned, another data set now to compare 2022 with. Ben, did you want to add anything to what I said? I'll add, I, you know, that's one of the great things I think about this National Zoning Atlas project is that it it is all really public facing, and so for our Montana Zoning Atlas, you know we've we've made sure that not only is our findings out there and publicly accessible, but also um, the GitHub file for all of our shape files that we were able to get from the local governments. And then our, our actual data uh, that we collected through our spreadsheet um, is available and publicly accessible. And, uh, you know, one of the things we did when we published the Atlas is we emphasized that, you know, look, we invite others to join us to continue to not only update this, this work, but also to expand it. Uh, we only, you know, as I mentioned, we only looked at 13 counties. Um, you know, really, I don't think there's many more counties that have in Montana that have extensive zoning. So I think we covered most of it. But one of the one of the gaps that we did have was 
Montana, we found out, has something kind of unique that we haven't really seen in other states. We have like this grassroots style zoning called uh, citizen initiated zoning. Um, so we have, you know, traditional county imposed zoning. But then in Montana, citizens can get together. 65% of the property owners in a 40 acre area can get together and form their own zones. And those are actually kind of quasi sovereign jurisdictions. And so um, we weren't able to assess those at all in our Montana zoning atlas. And that's something that we welcomed future research on. Anyone else? I will add one other thing. When uh, we sure. were working on the Connecticut atlas, uh, the first one that was launched, as uh, I mentioned, that they did a lot of ADU reform uh, subsequent to the launch of the atlas. And so this summer, we're trying to do that update. And we recommend most teams to pick a cadence to kind of do their updates on a regular basis. Um, and knowing that the cities might be changing their zoning much more rapidly, the more rural areas. I mean, I've seen codes from like 1965 <laughs> that haven't changed. So, you know, some of this, it, it'll it'll depend on the, the jurisdictions. I don't think it's it's reasonable to, you know, uh, you know, something like New York City, where every every council meeting, there might be a vote to change zoning somehow that that would all be done in the moment. But I do think that in, you know, doing a reasonable, you know, every six months, every year, making sure that you're getting um, all the major changes in is likely to happen. Um, and we are kind of looking forward to long term, how do we structure the atlas, the national atlas itself to ensure that we can support the state teams. Um, not all of them intend to continue on into the future. And so how can we produce funding and other streams and um, hopefully, um, you know, some of the local um, state governments have shown interest in helping maintain these data sets. So, you know, we're still thinking through long term, the big picture for the for the nation for the updates. All right. Um, so next question, when it and again, we're still kind of overarching here. Um, when it comes to the type of data that's collected, are we able to take into account, like, overlay type districts or like form based codes like you know kind of not your traditional euclidean pieces of zoning that you normally you know sometimes see but also um like agricultural and rural just like just the different types of zoning outside of like just your regular city zoning how do we take that into account is it taken into account I will say the methodology, we do track every zoning district, right? So if it's in the zoning text or on a zoning map, it is tracked. Uh, we we try to limit ourselves to that. So I know uh, a lot of the things like um, uh, like master plan communities, whether that's, a um, you know, in, in New York City, it was called large scales or planned residential developments, all of those site plan specifics, we do not, we do not capture. So that is not one that we do. Um, but I will say that we, uh, for the agricultural, there is methodology around that. We treat agricultural actually as primarily residential because in many parts of the country, I mean, especially look at the Carolinas, you're seeing just rapid um, residential growth in agricultural areas, and that's a real issue. So we are trying to, um, to capture that. Um, as for the non-residential uses, your industrial, your um, you know, facilities siting. I mean, I think that was my first question when I came to the project. I'm like, you can't just have residential and have a full community. You need those, those public services, those public community facilities, those stores, you know, the jobs, all of that. And, you know, I understand now, having been here, you know, a good six months, why we didn't include it, because when you start going through these codes, it is all over the place with the commercial and industrial and non-residential, and trying to find a way to actually synthesize that is is kind of, I, I, I didn't realize how different zoning codes could be in a way. The beauty of this process is that we do simplify it into this very structured methodology, and it does account for form base and all those other things. But um, but it is it does not yet uh, account for particular non-residential uses. However, now you heard from New Hampshire, they have a whole host of additional fields that they added in, and each state can optionally do that. So if there is a common thread that they want to pull in, they can. For instance, Connecticut pulled in their historic mill districts. So you know there is that ability to add to it as needed at a team by team level. But because commercial and industrial are treated so different in, in different places, it really wasn't, uh, I think, feasible. I think the other thing to think about is if we have, you know, over 100 fields per, uh, per zoning district, and we let's say, like, 
on the low end, let's say we have 10 districts per jurisdiction per 30,000 jurisdictions. That's a lot of data entry already. And I try to encourage teams that when they're thinking about this, you know, you, you really, this is a lot of data to, to put in and it's gonna be a lot of data to maintain long-term. So we try to keep it small. And I think once we get this national data set open, then we can start thinking about other types of uh, information we might want to track, like resilient, uh, like things around floodplains and resilient, resilient um, regulations and uh, aqua, um, what do they call the, um, where the uh, um, water table is. And, you know, you have these, these conservation zones, they're all in there. We capture them all, but we don't really categorize them. And that's something that might be a future thing to think about. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that. I, you know, it's, What's really interesting about the Atlas methodology and producing an Atlas is that I, I think you discover things that you wouldn't have otherwise um, being able to, to work on visualizing data. Um, one of the things that we found with overlays in Montana was, you know, almost every jurisdiction um, allowed for, to some extent, uh, planned unit developments. Um, but you know, some some cities or local government jurisdictions would say that those are overlay districts. But when we, you know, after we collected the data, we said, okay, this is great. And then when we actually got into the GIS files, we found that the the way that the county was treating those districts was not like an overlay. It was like their own district with their own rules. And so that led us having to go back through and kind of reassess how we treated that in the data. Um, and that's not something that, you know, you would be able to see just reading a zoning code uh, for the text. Um, so, yeah, this this Atlas methodology really allows you to kind of tease out exactly what's going on. I wanted to that with two um, overlay zones, I mean, there are different types of overlays. Uh, there, there are those overlays that are uh, either that are mapped in the zoning ordinance or that are linked to uh, a an outside map, such as uh, stratified drift aquifers, which you know USGS has mapped, and, and it was done in New Hampshire in the, in the 80s and early 90s. So we have those maps available. So if a municipality is regulating on the basis of an existence, uh, the existence of an aquifer, a stratified drift aquifer, then we have that. That's easy, easy to do, even if it hasn't yet been digitized. Uh, other types of, of overlays have the characteristic of a, of a floating zone. So, for example, a wetland, uh, and I'm not talking about national wetland inventory um, uh, mapping, but a lo locally identified or based on uh, state definition uh, wetland area, which can only be identified through specific site analysis. That's impossible to map. Uh, so it might exist in the zoning ordinance, but it can't be represented in this way. Uh, next question. I, I'm seeing a lot of questions kind of trying to, people are trying to put their head around how they can use it on the front end and what it looks like. Um, and maybe Kendall, I know you said you were, you had um, your Atlas kind of ready to, at the ready. Um, but so I, there's just a lot of questions about how they can use it, what it looks like, how user-friendly really is it. Um, so Kendall, if you wouldn't mind just kind of walking us through a little bit, and obviously each state's atlas is going to look different and maybe function a little bit differently, or am I wrong? Or is all of the user front end going to look the same? I guess that's a question too. For now, each state will have their own their own thing. And, and even going forward after we produce a national one, they'll still have that ability. Each state team owns their own data and they can they can use it however they like. Um, so there, that's that's you know, our data agreement works that way. Um, the National Atlas will host a national map, and we are, like I said earlier, we are working on what those filters and what that interactivity will be. We're not there yet, but um, but definitely um, we've been we've been looking at all the state atlases as they as they come out and trying to figure out, you know, what's the what you know pulling out those best practices from that and what what people seem to really appreciate about each one. Yeah, I've just pulled up here. Um, this is our Montana Zoning Atlas 1.0. So this is where we had kind of a, a more limited um, application of the National Zoning Atlas methodology. And, you know, one of the things we did with our parcel analysis is uh, created this like slide deck um, that kind of step by step walks uh, p uh, viewers through kind of the slides that I provided to you all in my presentation. Um, and then, of course, they can go uh, 
toggle and filter themselves on the map. Now with the expanded zoning atlas methodology, where we use the full methodology for our Montana zoning atlas 2.0, I'll jump over to that. Um, that allows you to toggle a much greater amount of uh, of, of different variables. So um, this is the the full map, and as you can see in Montana, you know you're able to see lots of lots of federal unbuildable land in Montana, but I'll zoom in on Missoula just to kind of give you guys a perspective here. This is Missoula, Montana that we were viewing in my presentation. And you're able to go in and toggle, you know, where is two family housing allowed? Where is it allowed as of right versus only allowed after a public hearing? Um, or is it income restricted? That's another uh, key variable that we measured because a lot of cities seem to be only allowing for some of this missing middle development if there are certain income restrictions. Um, so we were able to measure that. You can also toggle on and off minimum lot sizes. Um, so you can see in Missoula, some of the surrounding areas uh, require half an acre or more uh, that I'm toggling on and off here. You could also look at heights of buildings where uh, you know they allow for five plus stories in Montana or in Missoula. Um, you can also zoom in on accessory dwelling units. You can look at... Um, uh, where planned residential developments or PUDs are allowed. Um, so you have lots of different options. And uh, if anybody has a specific request, I can pull something up. Oh, I should mention, you can, you, the tooltip notes are provided, they provide a lot of good information as well. And, and um, I believe that the, the National Zoning Atlas uh, project is continuing to update all this stuff. We were kind of one of the first guinea pigs to launch our atlas. So I think that some of the information about parking and things like that that are included in the tooltip notes, perhaps on ours, are going to uh, be even uh, more interactive on other future atlases. But as you can see on ours, um, that's where you can find parking information. And you can click on certain jurisdictions and get a percentage uh, that meets your, your criteria in your toggles. And that's really useful for being able to go and just say, where could you build a duplex on a 2,500 square foot lot uh, in the city of Azula? You can find that out with the Atlas. Thank you. Um, in our remaining minute, because I want to get this question in, um, Ben, you had started talking about exclusionary zoning and how this can support future policy. Um, could you give an example? Um, is it just merely look at this map and see how exclusionary everything is, like just the shock value of it, because it's just so clear. Um, but are there other ways in which the the zoning atlas can support future policy uh, to, to reverse this type of zoning? I think it's, it's really important to remember that at least in New Hampshire, and I think this is true elsewhere, uh, we are characterizing the zoning atlas as policy neutral. Uh, we're simply presenting the analysis and, and let others uh, move forward with the policy. So uh, housing advocates have latched onto this as, as an important uh, source of data for them to make presentations to legislators. Legislators themselves are, are, are going through the data and figuring out, well, what do we need to do to change some of these things? Um, so th that's all important. It also has to happen at the local level. And so that's where we need to have uh, these really important and difficult conversations about how we regulate uh, through you know, local governmental action, the private uh, the use of private property. Uh, and that's, that's what zoning is all about. Uh, so we uh, at New Hampshire Housing recently published a, a guide called How Do We Talk About Housing? And it's really for grassroots advocacy, nine-step methodology for people who want to make change at the local level to have those conversations and to uh, figure out how you're going to get to change at the local level. And this gets to that, that poll question at the outset, uh, Christine. Uh, should it be state? Should it be local? It's got to be a combination of both. Okay. Thank you. This was a fabulous conversation. And I'm so glad we were able to bring this group together to talk about the NZA. Um, reminder, you can uh, view a recording of this up on our YouTube channel. It'll be up sometime on Monday. Just search Planning Webcast Series on YouTube and we'll pop up. Don't forget to log those CM credits. You can register for all of our upcoming sessions at ohioplanning.org slash 
planning webcast. Um, and I did put in the Q&A, which I think was public, for those folks that have questions about their state's NZA and volunteering and potential uh, sponsors of, um, of their statewide atlas, um, you can always head over to the National Zoning Atlas website, zoningatlas.org, uh, to get contact information to see which states are uh, currently working on projects and contact information and all that good stuff. Uh, or you can reach out to me and I can connect you. So uh, everyone, thank you for joining today. Thank you for Northern New England chapter for sponsoring. Uh, it was, it's great to see everybody um, and everyone have a great weekend and we'll talk next time. Bye.